Welcome to episode 21 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined in studio, in physical studio. Three weeks in a row. That's right, by my good friend, John Sloat. All right. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm transitioning into summer mode now with just recording the day after Memorial Day. And so yeah. that, that for me kind of feels like the official kickoff of summer. And we both showed up in shorts this morning as well to uh, to record. Yes. Yes. And the building is still almost vacant because of COVID stuff. Mm-hmm. We have one uh, staff person working in the office. And so, um, yeah, nice and quiet and, and good to be in person again. Did, uh, did you and the fam do anything exciting for Memorial Day? Uh, we had a busy Memorial Day hmm. weekend. Um, I, I'm going to save part of it for the uh, one thing I like, uh, which okay. I might have to violate and go with two, which might have to get a judge's ruling oh, on that. Boy. <laughs> but um, we had a nice uh, cookout with our church small group, Mo- uh, part of it. A couple couples weren't there, but that was fun. Nice to be outside and be. That's the first time we had met in person since the beginning of all this, which was fun. And um, the weather was scorching hot, but has some shade and it was good. What about you? Yeah, we uh, Andrew and I did some projects around the house. Uh, I did some building projects in the garage that I've been been just super enjoying. It's been nice to use my hands. Uh, and then we similarly did a cookout with our small group, sort of a potluck sort of thing. So we met at uh, met at the farm where my life group leader lives and yep. uh, showed Andrea the pig. She held a goat, and now she I wants a goat, which I'm not happy about. But. <laughs> That's got to be against your homeowners association neighborhood yeah, covenant thing. First words out of my mouth. The HOA is not going <laughs> to like the goat. <laughs> Yes, yes. Going to your life group leader's farm can be a dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, you could have ended up bringing home a, a, a house pet pig. That, that, that's, that's a live possibility yeah, I, there. I, I, don't, I don't need a pig. Yeah. <laughs> Again, HOA. Yeah. But, but the hedgehog is still on the table? Hedgehog's on the table. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see how that develops. But so the world of sports still largely shut down, mm-hmm. but we're starting to hear some rumors, some indications of how it might restart, right? Yeah, yeah. Baseball's looking at a, at a half season or, or a little more than a half season, Something I suppose. Something like that, yeah. 82 games starting on uh, July 4th weekend right at the All-Star break, which has been a pretty consistent message probably for the last three or four weeks. Uh, either I've heard a couple different things centered in Arizona, centered in Florida, or just playing in home stadiums and playing regionally. Um, against against your teams, don't you think Arizona's got to be a no start? Like it, you you know how hot it gets in Arizona, right? I've actually never been to Arizona, but I've never I been cannot... there either. But I've seen the temperature reports, like oh, it's a hundred and ten in Phoenix today, and it's a dry heat. <laughs> okay, well it's still a hundred and ten. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a desert, right? Arizona's yeah. mostly desert, so it just seems strange to me that um, they would do that in Arizona, but. Um, I know the NBA has also been talking about a, a restart in uh, in July as well, but um, there's what, what's interesting to me about that is the fact they're talking about having all the teams and personnel at a I guess like a Disney complex in Orlando, and just basically kind of sectioning them off and saying you're going to live here for the next whatever it is two months that they're going to do or, or whatever. And they're still talking through, are we going to do any regular season? Are we just going to move straight to the playoffs? Are we going to have like a mini tournament for maybe like the eighth seeds or something to get in? Yeah. It's all, all over the place at this point. Yeah. And that, that feels hard to have everybody in the same place for, you know, in a bubble basically. Yeah. Uh, particularly when you have young men who are, uh, active and want to get out and feel invincible, and I, I just don't think they're going to respond respond well to that. It will be interesting, and uh, and then what what will they do inevitably when someone does get coronavirus? Right? Yeah, you have that many people, like someone is going to get it. Oh yeah, and and be symptomatic, right? Absolutely. And yeah. so, what do you do? Do you shut everything down at that point? Do you you know, how do you handle that? Do you just isolate that person and say, okay, you're done. You can't be, you can't play anymore. All those questions are being sorted out. Yeah. 
and they're hard. They're hard. They're hard questions to answer. I mean, yeah. let, let, let's be honest. We we don't know the best way to deal with this. We're, we're still we're still figuring it out, and we would love to have our sports back. Yes, but. yes. And when you have billions of dollars in the mix, that's a further complication, right? You've got people. You've got owners and players who are like, we've lost out on on billions of dollars in terms of revenue. Oh yeah. Well, and and advertisers and and all sorts of things that are missing revenue as well. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And and not to mention stadium workers and and those those, those kinds of people that probably need the money uh, more than right. a, a billionaire or a, or an NBA player. Although I've heard uh, NBA players and and all professional athletes, not just NBA players, burn through cash like nobody's business. Yeah. Oh yeah. That that's very typical. Um, it's, it's very common. I forget the numbers, but I've seen statistics where the percentage of pro athletes who are broke within three to five years of ending their sports careers is through the roof because they just assume that they, you know, naively assume, oh, well, I can just live at this level of income and, and not realizing, you know, after about the five to seven to ten years of your career, suddenly your income is going to take a steep drop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I think it was Adrian Peterson who flew. Uh, I think it was twenty-five or thirty people out for his thirtieth birthday, out to California, rented a rented a place. He flew everybody out first class, you know, and and through this huge two three day party. Yeah. We did not do that for my 30th birthday. No, no, <laughs> we did not. We did not. Uh, other news from the sports world is with the end of the 30 for 30 on The Last Dance, the 10-part series, uh, ESPN re- released a new 30 for 30, a two-parter on Lance Armstrong. Part one aired this past Sunday, and then part two will air uh, next Sunday. Did, did you watch it? I did. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I think I was again struck by uh, what an awful human being Lance Armstrong is. That was my first impression was, yeah, they. even though I think they could have played that up even more, the reality is they they make it uh, very obvious. And I didn't wasn't familiar with Lance Armstrong in his earliest days. No. And so I didn't realize that he was an arrogant, arrogant dude right from the start, that he had this sort of um, just moxie about him that went beyond sort of the confidence to, you're just a jerk Mm -hmm. (laughs) to everyone around you. Did you watch it? Oh, absolutely! Absolutely, I was struck with the same with this with the same things. There, there were parts of a backstory that that I didn't know. Like I I didn't know his uh, mom had had him at uh, sixteen, seventeen years old. um, That he was. It seems it seems like hit pretty regularly by his stepdad, um, where he gets his last name, and Mm -hmm. uh, seemed to struggle to have a any sort of male figure in his life. Also, Um, yeah. So, so that was that was disheartening and but but it was i mean i mean to see to see the arrogance spilling out of him and to the competitiveness as well and yes to to hear some of the things that came out of his mouth back then and and to hear him try to couch those things today yep in, in his interview in his modern interviews while saying like yeah that happened but here's 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 what was going <laughs> yeah. on you know yeah it it also did a nice job of showing how pervasive the doping was in the cycling world Mm -hmm. that everybody was doing it and they had found a drug i can't remember what the name of it was it's like beginning with an e like epo or something epo that sounds right to me okay that was indetectable Mm -hmm. uh undetectable by testing at that point and so the fact that basically i think i will give lance armstrong credit in in that he said basically the choice was Either you do it and and have a chance to win, or you don't and you had no chance. Yeah, and so I'm not justifying what he did, but it is one of those things where you think, well, um, it's understandable why people do it. Not justifying it, but it's very understandable. Yeah, and uh, the other thing that struck me, I don't think I realized his cancer was as bad as it was. Yeah. Um, his cancer was severe, mm-hmm. and it sounds like he didn't realize he had a problem uh, until 
much later down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we do have something a little bit out of the ordinary today. We're making yeah. a special announcement. Do we? I don't. We don't have a drum roll or anything like that. But uh, we 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 want to allow our listeners to participate. And so, as a result, we had, we originally had planned on doing this with March Madness. Right, mm-hmm. that was going to be our our initial foray into. Yeah, participate with us. We'll compete against each other for bragging rights, and we were going to send, a, you know, the winner a, a signed copy of one of my books, and and then of course, you know, COVID nineteen said not so no. fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be our second attempt at listener participation, and so John, what are we going to do? Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna read a book together starting in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we want to give in two th- episodes. Yeah. In two episodes. Yeah. Yep. And so we want to give you the opportunity to be able to uh, order the book. It's taking forever for Amazon to deliver books uh, because they've, I think they've put books a bit on the back burner. Um, yep. Which, you know, it's a, it's a problem in my eyes, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, who's deeming those non-essential <laughs> items? So let's, let's get Jeff Bezos on the, uh, on the podcast and ask about that. I need my books. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, so we'll, uh, we'll break it down into sections. I don't think we've determined those yet. And, and have you read along with us. Uh, so if you, if all of you want to go out and order uh, the book by Dane Ortland, uh, Dane, D-A-N-E, Ortland, O-R-T-L-U-N-D, uh, his book, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. Uh, we're going to be reading that together. It's um, the, the basic premise of the book is this is this is the heart of Christ. This is the heart mm-hmm. of Christ for sinners. This is the heart of Christ for, for people who are suffering. Uh, it's it's uh, I, I have not gotten my copy yet, but but you have yours. Accessible, Very. readable, short chapters. Yes. Um, and so we'll be we'll be taking chunks of it probably over three three to four week period and just having ten minutes on the pod where we we discuss and talk about it. And it's it's been regularly called one of the one of the best books of twenty twenty. Yeah, and it's. I just want to assure our listeners that even if you're not a sort of theology nerd like we are, mm-hmm. this is accessible to you. This is readable. So don't don't think, oh, well, that's one of those really sort of heavy hitting, deep kind of theological books that Matt and John like to read. So that's not for me. There is depth here, don't get me wrong, but sure. it's super accessible, very warm, pastorally oriented, and I, uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to doing this with our listeners. Dane is a good dude. He started in the Wheaton PhD program right after I finished at oh, Wheaton. Oh, okay. And so we've known, we've known each other since then, and he is actually now the vice president, one of the vice presidents at Crossway Publishers. Uh, overseeing their whole Bible division, so uh, and yet he continues to to write and produce things that are very helpful in terms of um, helping people grow in Christ and and universally considered just just a good guy. He is. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a word against him. Yeah, Dane's a good guy. So, um, and this really is is a a byproduct of something that you and I have done for the last probably four five years. Yeah, or four so, or five years. Yeah, where. During the summer, I've organized a reading group of guys who are still in the area reading a book on biblical theology, and we're going to do that again this summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, we'll start up next week, and uh, we've typically read a book from the New Studies in Biblical Theology series, which is a little deeper dive. Yeah. And so uh, this year, we're going to um, read—is it called Including the Stranger? I believe so. By Daniel Firth, I believe is his, yeah, his Firth. name. Yeah, I, I was going to say Colin Firth, but I think that's an actor. That's an actor, yeah. yeah. Probably no relation. Pro- probably no relation. Yeah, it's safe to say, I think. But uh, it's about uh, texts dealing with the foreigner in uh, in the prophetic books, yeah. in, the, in the former prophets. So what we tend to think of as the historical books, Joshua through uh, Second Kings, basically. So it'll be interesting to, to read through that with. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward it, to it. I think it'll be a good read. Yeah. yeah. So that leads us to kind of our main topic for today, and that is why is reading important? Yeah, that's a big question. 
obviously reading is something that's been uh, very important to both of us in our lives. And so we also realize that there are some people who are not naturally bent towards reading. Mm -hmm. So I think part of what we want to try to accomplish is to make an appeal to work at becoming a reader if you're not. And if you're already a reader, maybe to to, to stretch you in some ways to think about reading and uh, reading practices and those kinds of things. So we'll, we'll just kind of see where this discussion goes. We have some ideas, but who knows? Yeah. So, so why don't we start here? Uh, Doc, uh, why, why is reading important? Well, I think that if, if the, the first thing that comes to mind is that it, ex- it tends to expand our minds and our experiences. You can vicariously experience a lot of different things through the medium of reading a book. And mm-hmm. that is different than watching a television show because your mind and your imagination has to supply, in essence, the visual. Yeah. Whereas a visual medium like television or video or something like that, it gives it to you. And it it, it shapes inherently what, what you're seeing. But I also think that just on a theological level, it, it's no accident that God reveals himself in words mm-hmm. and that he not only reveals himself in words that are expected to be repeated orally, but that he specifically inspired his people to write things down that were intended to be read. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the, the the ultimate title that the Apostle John chooses for Jesus is the Word, the, the self-expression yeah. of who God is, hmm. that he chooses. Out of all the titles he had available to him, you, know, you look through all the I Am statements in, in John's Gospel and other things, but at the beginning, as the sort of the, if you want to know who Jesus is, he's the Word. He is the fullest expression of who God is, and the fact that he chooses a title that communicates that tells us that I think that there's something very, um, very deeply theological about any sort of reading. And it's also, I think, something that is um, just kind of fundamental to helping shape who we become as people. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a good word. So have you, have you always been a reader? Were you a reader as a kid? Like, or, or has that been something that's developed later in life? That's really developed more later in life for me. So probably even college into seminary that was developing uh, f- for me, uh, partly by virtue of having to read for classes. I've, I've picked course. up the discipline yep. uh, quite a bit. Uh, however, when I was a kid, if I got a hold of a book that was a good story and that I could really sink my teeth into, um, I would read it and I would just finish it. Like, like there were, there was very intense, right? Right. There, 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 right. It was either I was reading some, I was reading something and I was finishing it sure. or I was not yeah. reading anything. So gotcha. it's really been more of a, a later piece of life where I've, where reading has been a, a major part, um, of my life. How about, how about yourself? I, I was pretty much a reader from my earliest memory. Um, hmm. I, I always enjoyed reading as a kid. I tended to read more in the uh, in the fantasy and science fiction genres hmm. and very much enjoyed that. I probably didn't start reading more nonfiction until later high school and into college when I other people, other believers introduced me to good substantive Christian books yeah. that were helpful. Like, for example, um, I think maybe one of the first nonfiction Christian books I ever read that I can remember is Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. Hmm. <laughs> so kind of into the deep end right away, but very much enjoyed it, thought it was helpful. And, um, I think from there, it just kind of continued to grow my desire to read and enjoyment in reading. Yeah. What, what would you say your reading uh, habits are like? Like like how regularly are you reading? When are you reading? What time of day are you reading? What are you reading? Are you reading a particular genre at a particular time of day? Are you reading one book at a time, multiple? 
Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, I, I tend to read several books at a time, Mm -hmm. typically at least two or three, sometimes as many as five or six, depending on what's going on. And so I, I personally benefit from having multiple books because it prevents me from getting bogged down in one. Mm -hmm. There are times where, depending on the length of the book and the subject matter or just the depth or the writing or whatever, it might be a book that you think, I should read this, this is helpful, but this is a longer book, and if I just continue to kind of slog through it, I'm not going to enjoy it and get as much out of it. So if I take a break from that and read something else, um, I find that, That's much more enjoyable to me. Hmm. And I have regularly found a sort of providential convergence of reading two very different books. But because I'm reading two different books on two very different subjects, I have both of those things in mind. And so I I start to make connections that maybe otherwise I would not have. Interesting. Hmm. If I was just reading one of them by itself and then read the next one after it. So I think the... The combination of reading multiple books at the same time can often fuse connections in my head that otherwise I might not have made, but turn out to be very helpful and beneficial. Hmm. What about you? Do you tend to read multiple books at one time, or are you kind of a, you know, are you monogamous in your reading? Or are you, <laughs> <laughs> or are, are you uh, polygamous in your reading? Uh, Polygamous, I suppose. Um, I always, I always have at least at least two or three going. Um, normally, uh, a bigger classic book or something that's a bit more difficult to read. And mm-hmm. usually, usually, yeah. I'm reading that following uh, my Bible reading in the morning. So, uh, right now, it's uh, City of God that I've been pushing through for on and off for the past year or so. That's a thick book. Uh, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm four four pages a day, maybe maybe yeah. in that book. You yeah. know. Um, and then uh, I'm also reading things uh, throughout the day uh, or or in the evening. And then and then I'm also a big proponent of the audio book. Uh, so I don't know if that counts, but if I'm if I'm working on a project or I'm doing something where I'm out on my own for for long stretches of time, I usually have an audio book going of some kind. So let me follow up on that because I I've had mixed mixed results in my own experience with audio books. Mm-hmm. So do in your audiobook listening is it across the genres meaning like you're maybe one time you're in a nonfiction book other times you're in a a novel or something like are you all over the spectrum or does it tend to gravitate towards one or two genres yeah. that you N- novels to? I'm li- I'm listening to stories okay yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, right now um Andrew and I just finished the movies The Maze Runner uh, I don't mm-hmm. know if you've you've I've, heard of those I've heard of the movies yeah um, they were pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I was like, man, I wonder what the books are like. I wonder how they differ. You know, that's always mm-hmm. one of the fascinating pieces, how do movies and books differ. Yeah. And so right now I'm listening through uh, the the first book, which the plot is really, really good. The writing is it's not, it's not so good. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how I'll get through most of my novels. I very, very seldom pick up a novel and just am, am reading through it. Um, but I will say... Uh, I will say in the evenings I usually have something a little bit different as I'm getting ready for bed or something like that, something that I'm reading through, whether it's Sherlock Holmes or uh, or uh, right now I'm making my way through a graphic novel, which is different. Yeah, I've never dipped into that that genre. Yeah, it's it's a lot of pictures. It's 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 very different. Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, reading. How would you distinguish what is different about reading a book versus reading websites or just sort of blog entries or or, or those kinds of things? Do you Mm. distinguish that at all in terms of book reading or longer form reading versus uh, kind of short form, oh, here's a blog post at the Gospel Coalition that's 800 words, 1,000 words, or things like that. Oh, versus, come on, the Gospel Coalition doesn't do blog posts okay. that short. <laughs> 2,000 to 3,000 <laughs> words, sorry. But um, so do you distinguish 
how do you, how do you think of those different kinds of reading? How sharply do you distinguish between them? What what do you mean distinguish? Do I read them differently? Do I read them? When it comes to so, when you say when you think about I'm going to sit down to read. Okay. What do you gravitate towards? Do you? Yeah. How, 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 do you distinguish those at all? Yeah, when I when I sit down to read, it's usually a book. Um, I'm I'm picking up a, usually a physical book, unless yeah. I'm on a plane or something. I might I might power up the Kindle, okay. but most of the time I like I like the physical book. Agreed. Um, I I think articles and and even news articles and things like that, mm-hmm. which which are valuable and I think I think are great uh, to to be reading, and it, and it's even a good first step if you're um, not an active reader as as a good move into yeah, it's into a good reading. gateway drug is what yeah you're yeah exactly <laughs> um i usually read those things uh throughout the day yeah through twitter or um, um just in between meetings or stuff like that that's when i usually pick those up and do you find because there's research out there that i think has suggested this do you find that how you read those kinds of uh literature for lack of a better term that t- those kinds of writings the the news article the blog post has that affected how you read longer form, whether it's books or that sort of thing? Because there's research that suggests that people don't really read those blog posts and articles anyway. They skim, yeah. right? So they, yeah. they see the headline, it catches their attention, they click on it, and um, they look at it and go, oh, so they kind of power skim through it and go, oh, yep, this this more or less, I agree with this, oh, I don't agree with this. And there's research out there that suggests that that sort of rapid fire, quickly look at this article, okay, move on to another article, like has had an impact on people's mm. ability to read a book that has a sustained argument. That's that people's abilities in terms of reading comprehension to go deeper has actually diminished or it takes more work on people's part to do that. Have you experienced that? I, probably. Do you feel I mean, like that, your attention that, span is sometimes affected by that maybe? I, I think my attention span is affected by a lot of things. <laughs> um, okay. I, I, I don't know if it's, it's – I don't know if I can blame the Gospel Coalition or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal on <laughs> okay. uh, my – you know, blame my attention span on those things. Uh, yeah. But uh, – but um, yeah, I, I would say just sort of e- even with social media and and you know constantly refreshing and do, mm-hmm. doing those things, I would say my my attention span has taken a toll just by modern society. Whether it's the constant blog post or whether it's the news articles, that I, I do have to try to focus when I when it comes to reading. That I have to be disciplined, and I'll I'll find that like I'll wander down the page too fa- too quickly, and and I'll be like, oh, I need to, I need to go back up. I need to read through that again and and, yeah. and rediscover. Let's talk a little bit about uh, different levels of reading. Okay. Do you distinguish at all? In other words, when you when you get a book, mm-hmm. we, we tend to get a lot of books, right? You know, even just think recently, uh, Together for the Gospel, one of the cool things about going to Together for the Gospel is they give you a bunch of free books. This year that didn't happen, so they sent them, they shipped them. Yeah, like tw- 20 free books, something, uh, some, something ridiculous some crazy like, that. like that. It's great. Yeah. But... My question is, do you do you have different levels of reading? Meaning, do you read every book the same way? No. <laughs> um, so with something like City of God that I'm currently working my way mm-hmm. through, um, I'm, moving, I'm moving at a pretty slow clip, I'm trying to understand his argument, trying to understand why he's saying what he's saying, even uh, as he talks about ancient gods or ancient characters, you know, Googling them to figure out who they are, sure. you know, th- those sorts of things. Uh, if I'm reading a book on, oh, goodness, uh, uh, on leadership, I'm looking for the main point and skipping a lot of the examples mm-hmm. and skimming through the examples. Okay. So, so yeah, if, if, if that answers the question a little bit, yes, I read different, different books different ways. And you're okay with that? Your conscience doesn't trouble you at all? No, no. And okay. one of the big differences between <laughs> you and I— is uh, is I'm okay in the middle of a book going I'm done with this and you're you have to finish. I I do I do think I, I I practice a similar kind of approach to reading in the sense that I 
feel the fr- I do not read every book at the same depth. Yeah. There are some books that I read slowly, I highlight, I'm marking them up. I am fully invested and engaged in the argument, all the details and putting it together. Mm-hmm. But there are plenty of books that I will look at and I'll think I should be aware of this book, but it's a, it's the 12th book on this subject that I've probably been familiar with. So that's where I'll end up maybe do, probably doing a power skim and sort of looking at chapter headings, reading maybe the first couple paragraphs of a chapter, the last couple paragraphs, chapter skimming the headings, and just seeing, is there anything new here? Yeah. Uh, maybe there's something new. Okay, I'll dip in here and, and read a little bit more. Or I'll go, eh, I think I, I'm, I'm familiar enough with this book that I can move on. Yeah. Because there's just, there's just too much, especially as a scholar. There's just way too much for me to try to do a deep dive read on everything that is even in my discipline, let alone when it comes to the broader field of ministry or culture, other things like that that I'm interested in. I can't, I I don't have that kind of time. So, but I do struggle. There's just that (laughs) twinge of starting a book and not finishing. I've done it. There've been, there've been books even on the deep dive where I'm like, I just, I'm not enjoying this and I need to stop. So how many can you, can you, is it, can we count it on one hand the number of times you've done that? Probably two. Probably two hands. Okay. That's more than I thought. But, (laughs) but here's the thing. I tend to avoid doing that in part because when I get a book and make the decision, I'm going to go in on this. I first do a lot of what I talked about previously in terms of I look at the table of contents. I read intros and chapter, you know, mm-hmm. introductions, conclusions. I skim headings. I even, depending on the book, will sometimes look for a, uh, a review or two just to see what's the, what's the basic argument. I, okay, I think I will be able to press through and enjoy this. And uh, there's been a few where I've just said, why am I doing this? This is <laughs> I'm not enjoying this. And there are other books that are going to be beneficial. So I need to stop. So um, I, I know that comes from a certain uh, certain book that we recommend. Uh, do you want to do you want to talk about that book? Well, we've got well, we have three recommendations down here. Yeah. Um, we'll start with the classic, right? Yeah. So the, so the classic book on this is um, Mortimer Adler, which what a great name! Great name, Mortimer. Yep. Just he wrote a book called How to Read a Book. And part of the irony is that it's a very thick book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you wouldn't think, what do you mean? Why, we, why do we need a thick book on how to read a book? But he gives lots of practical advice. And even specifically when it comes to different types of literature and different types of reading. So recognizing you read a, a novel differently than you read a sort of um, – you know, Christian life kind of book. He doesn't use those terms, but that's the kind of idea here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so for a while, I had students read, I think, the first half of the book Mm -hmm. for my Greek exegesis class. I think you probably went through when I was doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's when I was exposed to that book. Because at at the end of the day, part of what that book helps you do is become a more careful and thoughtful reader. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some tips and tools of the trade that can significantly enhance your reading skills, comprehension, ability, and your enjoyment of reading. I think. Yeah, note taking. He has he has thoughts on note taking and and a number of uh, number of ways to read uh, more quickly. And yes, mm-hmm. now that book I think was originally written in 1972, maybe. So it's it's an old but classic book. So especially on the note taking piece, th- there's no digital envisionment there of what's going on there. But, you know, uh, I think people should mark in their books. Yeah. Agreed. And why I struggle to read from a Kindle. Yes. Though I find when it comes to, if I'm just looking for simple pleasure reading, a mystery novel, sure. spy thriller, or something like that, something that I don't, ex- that I have no interest in highlighting or marking or anything, mm-hmm. I find reading on my iPad through the Kindle app is just fine. Yeah. But anything that I want to mark up, I tend to struggle. I mean, there are ways to highlight in those apps and that kind of stuff. And but I, I just I'm I'm too traditional is probably in, in that sense. But 
the 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 next book though. Do you want to talk about the next book? Uh, the Tony Reiki book. Yeah, I, I've actually never read Tony Reiki's book. Okay. So so why it's not? very good. The the reason that I I bring it into this discussion, it's, uh, Tony Reiki wrote a book called Lit L I T, a Christian guide to reading books, and really it's in essence an attempt to more specifically frame the act of reading in a theological perspective, as well as giving tips for the trade and that kind of thing. And he's got a a chapter, it's like a 10 or 12 page chapter in this book that is really a sort of condensation of Adler's how to read a book in terms Mm. of the practical tools, tips, advice, etc. That if you look at the Adler book and go, "Um, I'm not sure I'm up for that, Tony Reinke's got a chapter in his book, Lit, A Christian Guide to Reading Books, that I think takes the best of what's in there and makes it very accessible. Oh, very cool. No, I'll have to to check out Reinke. Um, And you've got a a suggestion as well here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, goodness, probably two, two and a half years ago, uh, Ryan Johnson, who's a math professor here at Grace, uh, turned me on to a podcast called uh, FS Podcast, Farnham Street Podcast. Um, it's a Canadian podcast. This guy, uh, Shane, puts it out. He has a blog as well, fs.blog, uh, um, and he has tips on reading. And so he looks at uh, Adler's stuff and, and condenses that into a blog post on there. He also has how he takes notes as he reads, and I found that very helpful where he uh, will uh, – uh, take a chapter, underline, highlight all these things, and then at the end of the chapter, um, just in the, the additional space there, we'll put bullet points about what the chapter was about, and then we'll come back uh, two, three days later and review it. Nice um, as as a way to retain what he's reading. Yeah, that's so good. so he has some his great thoughts and ways to even read big books and, and mm-hmm. different things like that. Good, good. Yeah. I, before we uh, maybe as to, as a way of wrapping this discussion up, I, I just would want to plead with our listeners about the value of reading. Yeah, and we live in a in a culture and a time where we have moved from a sort of kind of print based culture to a visually oriented culture, and I just think that. There is something irreplaceable about the act of reading words from a page. I think even a physical page, not a digital page, but you know, let's let's skip past that for a minute. But I think that it is something that stretches the mind and it expands our horizons, forces us to think about new things in new ways and there, there's just a – one of the objections that I sometimes often hear is, well, I read things and I hardly remember anything of what I've read. So why bother? Mm-hmm. And so my response to that is reading forms and shapes the way we think and mm-hmm. the way that we ultimately live, even if we can't articulate specifics from a book where we – where those ideas help shape who we are. And this is sort of a, a, a throwing a bone to the to the pastor out there. This is related to, to preaching. So this is my sort of side note on, on this, okay? Okay. Um, we every everyone who preaches wants to hit the home run sermon, right? Mm-hmm. You want you want to have the one that is just like people walk away and go, I remember that one, and you want them to remember it ten years from now. Well, I remember when you preached that sermon on whatever it was, and it was amazing. And yet people are formed spiritually by the consistent preaching of God's word. Yeah. Even by sermons that you cannot remember Mm -hmm. a month from now, six weeks from now, two years from now, they form and shape us. The same is true of reading. But when we read books, they shape and mold and form us in ways that go way beyond our ability to specifically recall information from those books. That is not the end all and be all of reading. It's a great thing, and we should mm-hmm. strive to remember. But just because you can't doesn't mean, oh, well, I should just not read because it's, it's pointless. It's not pointless. It's forming, it's molding, it's shaping you. So, I, I would recommend if you want to hear the case for reading, you would check out the book, 
which I realize might maybe a big step for somebody that <laughs> that is anti reading. But uh, the book "Amusing Ourselves to Death" by Neil Postman. Yeah, it was written in the eighties, early eighties. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it it makes a great argument for reading, um, and and uh, makes an argument against the people who would say something like, "Well, I get all this from television. You yep. know, I get what I need from television much quicker, sure, much more digestible." He goes, he goes, no, 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 no. The the medium is the message is yep. sort of his tagline there. And Absolutely. So when when we are watching television, the the message the medium that the message or the message that the medium is communicating is that we are here to be entertained. Reading invites us to a dialogue with the author and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and so it forms us differently than television does. Absolutely. Good Neil work, po- Neil Postman. Good work. Good work. All right, athlete. We have had zero discussion about this. <laughs> zero conversation going live. So. Yeah. You want to walk through who we've got listed here? Yeah, uh, Neon Dion Sanders. Prime time. Uh, prime time um, is right at the top of the list. Yeah. Uh, football player, also baseball player. Yes, yes, um, indeed. Roberto Clemente, uh, also a baseball player. Legendary uh, Pittsburgh Pirate yep. from the early 70s, late 60s. I believe so. And he he died in a—was he the one that died in a plane crash? I'm not sure. I think so. Um, uh, Roger Clemens, uh, kind of all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, okay. Tim Duncan. <laughs> yes. Moving on to the NBA, yeah. Tim Duncan of the Spurs, a legendary uh, center slash power forward. Yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the last of the, of the great centers. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Uh, he was... Probably, though when he first came into the league, he was more of a power forward because he's playing with David Robinson, right. who was a traditional center. Yeah. And then uh, Dominique Wilkins. Freakish athlete. Yeah. He had the misfortune of playing at the same time as Michael Jordan, played for the Hawks. And he was sort of a—he was a version, hear me carefully, a version of Jordan in terms of the athleticism and the spectacular dunking and that kind of thing. And was could could on a given night uh, light up the scoreboard as well. He was nowhere near the total player that Michael Jordan was. Let's just be clear. And had a great dunk contest competition with Jordan, yes. right? Famous. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, of course, for our Ohio State uh, athlete here, we've got Paris Campbell, who just recently um, was drafted a year ago into the um, into the NFL by the Indianapolis Colts. Freakishly fast uh, wide receiver. And then B.J. Sander, a punter for the Buckeyes hmm. from 1999 to 2003. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Doc, who do you like? Man. Well, can we start eliminating players? I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with eliminating both of those Buckeyes from, from consideration. Oh, okay. Yep. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And then um, – any others that you can Im- you immediately look at and go, I'm good with eliminating that person. Um, Roger Clemens is a little scummy to me, <laughs> per- personally. <laughs> yes, he is. I mean, he was an amazing pitcher. Let's, He's very good, yes. And, um, yeah, but I can understand that. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I feel really drawn to, uh, for, for, our, for our guy to be Deion Sanders. Okay. I don't. I don't know how you feel uh, about. Yeah, that. we've not discussed this at all. Um, I have mixed emotions about that. He he was a freakish athlete. I tend to be annoyed by the flashiness and the self promotion, and that was a big, big element of his, oh, absolutely of his shtick. However. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty unique, and you know, all, when he was playing for the Atlanta Falcons in the in a in a NFL game, and then flying by helicopter to play for the Atlanta Braves in a playoff game. Yeah, I, I, I will not deny his his abilities at all. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, I'm not sure we have Bo Jackson. Maybe did you know? But but the same same not weekend? the same weekend slash day practically. Yeah. Um, but. It, yeah, I, I think that I, I will give a shout out to Tim Duncan. Who's the opposite of Deion Sanders. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the big fundamental. Yeah. Though he was he's not a self-promoter at all. However, 
he was a whiner. Hmm. He had the classic um, who me face when called for a foul. And it was a regular feature of his game that drove <laughs> me crazy. The, did Tim Duncan ever commit a foul? The like, what? You know, that, just that face. So, yeah. And I, I, he, his shot was always mid range, off the glass. Yep. He was a, a, a skilled user of the bank shot. Yeah. From all different angles. I'm good with going with Dion, though. Okay. Prime time. Prime time. Okay. Okay. One thing we liked. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll kick off here. Um, we uh, Andrea and I this weekend on Saturday uh, went up to an organic tree nursery uh, north of Fort Wayne uh, to pick up to pick to pick up a product that that was recommended to us, and uh, and had a great time talking to this guy in his late sixties, early seventies, who was this organic tree uh, nursery caretaker individual, and he was he was just a joy to talk to. And then uh, to, to hear some stories. And then we were able to ask him all the questions about our yard and about growing trees and, and all these things. And then we bought a tree from him and, and, uh, and headed out. And that was, uh, that was a lovely experience being up there on his, uh, on his little piece of farm. And his house is right there. I mean, just a, just a, it was just a good guy. His name was okay. Mark. Yeah. How did you find out about this? Uh, so Andrea's dad, uh, his company has the product there that, that we were going to pick up. Uh, it's called Holganics. It's a... It, to not get into the details, but puts <laughs> bacteria in the earth, so we have to keep it refrigerated. So we had to go to him to get it because it has to be refrigerated, and then. But it's supposed to develop roots uh, in plants. Uh, okay. And so we're we're pouring it on plants right now, hoping they they take and grow. So you have live bacteria growing in your refrigerator. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's grown, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. But 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 it's in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. right next to the milk. Yep. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. I really struggled with this because um, I think I'll say my one thing I liked this week was Saturday. This will allow me to cover both. I'm really okay with you going with two. There's yeah, no, I mean, there's no governing I mean, body. But it does say one thing we like, but it is our show. So yeah. um, I appreciate the flexibility. On Saturday, we bought a car, which. Uh, I don't tend to enjoy that experience, but I'm excited about having the car. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we also went to Ikea and used their curbside pickup feature and got some Billy bookcases, which are sort of a classic, iconic bookcase, well-built. So we have built a literally a wall hmm. of bookcases in our living room that uh, will transform the look of that. So that's been uh, – that's how I spent Sunday and – Monday, good chunks of that, putting those together and mounting them to the wall and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's, great. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. So sports rebooting, special announcement about reading with us, gentle and lowly, why reading is important, primetime, Deion Sanders, bacteria. Bacteria, yes. Billy bookshelves, new cars. We've done it. Mission accomplished. And so I think until next time, the Lord bless y'all real good. Later. Later.